Hello, Sunday School teachers. Huge celebration coming up this week, Reformation 500. It's been 500 years since Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the wall in Wittenberg, Germany. He had no idea what was going to happen, um, and we're still today benefiting from the events set in motion. Now that, that moment by itself wasn't a real huge deal, uh, but what happened as a result of it uh, has ramifications today not only for our, our church body, the Reformation has, did change the world in many and profound ways that uh, most people aren't aware of. Uh, compulsory education, government reforms, all this was set in motion by the Reformation. But what we really focus on is the most important thing of the Reformation, is that the gospel was made clearer than it had been. The gospel was being obscured. The church was emphasizing what you have to do. Luther put the emphasis on what God has already done for us in Christ Jesus. And that's what we strive to be faithful to to this day. And in your Sunday school lessons, uh, just a, a thing to always keep in mind when you teach these kids, we have a tendency to let the law predominate. And it's, the law is good. God's law is good. We want to tell people how to live in light of, of God's word. But the gospel has to predominate. The gospel is central to what we do. Kids can actually get the law anywhere, and the, or I shouldn't say anywhere, but places other than church, they can get the law. Only God's people, only the church can tell the gospel. So let's, every Sunday, proclaim that gospel, not just Reformation 500. As far as teaching the kids about the Reformation, the closing on Sunday will be about the anniversary of the Reformation. Sarah's got some materials to share with the kids during the closing. And I'm also going to include some resources in the email link, uh, link in the email that I send you. Uh, you can use those as you will, whether this Sunday or actually throughout the year. There's some neat coloring and flannel board, iPad type of activities if you want to use those throughout the year, or the years to come for that matter. Uh, make sure to, uh, to check out those resources. The uh, Bible story that is assigned this week is a short little passage from the Gospel of Matthew, parable Jesus tells about a man, well, two men, one who fared better than the other, the man who built his house on a rock, and the man who built his house on shifting sand. And the storm came, the guy who built his house on the rock made it through the storm, the guy who built his house on the shifting storm didn't make it through the storm. Interesting that there is a storm regardless. Please know this. If you are a Christian, that does not make you immune from storms. It just makes you able to be still standing when the storm is done. And this is actually, in, in some ways, our whole life is a storm. A series of storms, one after another. But I've come to a new appreciation of this as a pastor. Uh, all of the things I see on a weekly basis and, and the ways that God's people are afflicted by things wonder why this is. We don't have answers, but what we do know is God promises when this, that the storm will pass, and if we built our house on a rock, we will still be standing. So let's talk a little bit about that rock. The context of Matthew 7 is actually hugely important. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. So if you get a chance to read through the Sermon on the Mount, it might take 10, 20 minutes to read through, but it's helpful to get that whole context, and it's toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's kind of a summary ending. Jesus says, if you listen to these things I've been telling you and doing them, you will make it through the storm. If nothing else, go back to the beginning of Matthew 5, where the Sermon on the Mount begins, and read those first few verses, which we call the Beatitudes. It's kind of a bookend. You've got the Beatitudes at the beginning of Matthew 5. You have the House on the Rock parable in Matthew 7. These Beatitudes is Jesus speaking blessings. It's really kind of interesting. A lot of the Sermon on the Mount is some really heavy law, actually. Uh, Jesus telling us that we're murderers and adulterers, even if we've never actually committed these acts. He tells us what, what goes on in our heart. Jesus says at one point in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect. Well, is that all I gotta do, Jesus? I'll get right on that. Some heavy stuff. The kingdom of God is only for the perfect. So we go back to Matthew chapter five. Before Jesus gets into that heavy law, he speaks blessings. And his very first blessing is one for poor, the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. How does that work? 
The kingdom of God comes to the poor in spirit. I mean, don't I have to have a great spirit to get into the kingdom of God? No, the kingdom of God is only for those who are poor in spirit. And all of that heavy law that Jesus then talks about is in the service of letting us know that we are poor in spirit. Once we realize how empty we actually are, once we realize how broken we actually are, then he can fill us up with the kingdom. If we think we're doing pretty good, we don't need Jesus. Don't need to come to church or Sunday school. You're good. You're not good. We are all poor in spirit. Once we realize this, Jesus gives us his blessings. Really important in the context of Matthew 7, then, to realize this. Because you could take this out of context in Matthew 7 and make this about work, about doing things. If you just take this passage from Matthew 7, it actually sounds like, okay, I listened to Jesus, and now i got to do what he says, or else I'm going to perish in the storm. My house is going to collapse. <clears throat> you listen to Jesus, and you listen to him tell you that you're poor in spirit. And you listen to him tell you that yours is the kingdom of God. And if you are listening to this, and in faith holding on to this as truth, you are going to do the things of God, without even really being conscious of it, actually. Uh, a tree gives fruit. A tree's not conscious of giving fruit. I'm mixing my metaphors here beyond the house metaphor, but there's another metaphor in Scripture where we are the trees that give fruit. Jesus is actually the one who works in us so that we bear the fruit. Good trees give good fruit. That's just the way it is. So how do you get to be a good tree? Listen to Jesus' words. When you listen to his words of blessing, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Listen to Jesus' words, and you will be on a rock. You will be able to survive the tempest and the storm. It's going to come heavy after you. The devil's going to come with all, all of his forces against you. Keep listening to Jesus' words. You're going to make it through that storm. So to summarize our, our three things um, that we talk about every week, what does the story tell us about our identity? Well, it tells us where we are built, where our foundation is. The only place we can have a firm foundation. Your identity is in hearing the word of God. Now that is central to what a Christian does and a Christian is. If you run across anyone who says they're a Christian and they're never reading the Bible listening to God's word preached or spoken or taught, you've got to talk to them about what it really means to be a Christian. Christians hear the word of God. Christians hear the gospel of Jesus. And when Christians hear the gospel of Jesus, they know who they are. They know their identity. What does the story tell us about God's mercy, about God's mighty work? Well, that one's kind of obvious. He makes us so we can survive storms. This is what God does for us. We can't always see this during the storm. Now, during the storm, these two houses probably look pretty similar. It's only after the storm, after the dust is cleared, that we can see who was, who, who was in a better position here during the storm. And uh, in, in some ways, it won't be until the very last day when we will really see the benefits of being connected to Christ. But uh, the, the mercies of God is he will allow us to persevere through the storms that we face. And then finally... The, uh, the question of how to live in the world. Well, actually, there's where your middle passages between Matthew 5 and Matthew 7. If you really want to know the answer to that, read those passages. They tell us how to live in the world in light of our identity in Christ. But know that if you keep hearing about Jesus and his blessings, that's actually going to happen regardless. In my sermon on Sunday, I'm going to explore the tension between faith and works that have often defined the Reformation discussion, if we're saved by faith alone, how, how does that uh, affect our lives then? Do, do we look different than, than people who don't have faith? Do we do things different than people who don't have faith? That's what I'll be talking a little bit about in, in my sermon. I'll be talking about the fact that the concept of righteousness in the Bible is, uh, is talked about in two different ways, that there are actually two different kinds of righteousness. That's probably something you never heard before, although it's actually pretty pretty foundational to Lutheran theology. Luther wrote a lot, uh, a very pointed essay about this. Uh, there are two kinds of righteousness. So I'm going to be talking about that during the sermon. Uh, to the extent you're able to talk about that with your kids, please uh, 
please feel free to have those discussions. God bless your lessons this week. Happy Reformation.